Hi, we're live at Sync Summit here in the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, California. And we managed to catch up with Kenny Kerner, veteran of the music business and the man who discovered KISS. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. I really My appreciate pleasure, it. My pleasure, Rich. Good to be here. Thank you. You know, you've been in the business a long time, and I'm curious, at what point in your career, and in your life actually, did you decide that the music business was going to be what you pursued professionally? Uh, 45 years so far, and it happened accidentally. I grew up in Brooklyn uh, on a street corner, uh, Parkside Avenue, right across from the entrance to Prospect Park, and uh, there were about 30 or 40 other kids hanging out. They were all musicians. So I figured I'd learn how to play guitar. Uh, unfortunately for me, I play left-handed. And my guitar teacher comes in. He takes his guitar out of his case. I have mine on. I had it restrung. I had the fretboard moved to the other side. And I'm sitting there, and he looks at me and laughs. And he goes, you have your guitar on backwards. And I looked at him and said, you have yours on backwards. <laughs> and he walked out of the room and didn't want to teach me. So somehow I had to get into the music business. Nobody was going to teach me how to be a musician, so I just, you know, navigated towards the business side and started managing local bands. And just one thing led to another. I learned how to manage. I was the first guy in that area that actually rented a venue with his own money and put on shows, made money, started fan clubs, and little did I know I was doing marketing and branding before those words were even invented, and I've been doing it ever since, professionally. Now, <clears throat> at a certain point, you discovered one of the legendary bands, uh, KISS, and yes. I was wondering if you could tell us that story, how that came about. Also accidentally. Really? Okay. I think my life is one giant accident. <laughs> okay. So what happened was, I was working at Cashbox, and for your, your viewers who don't know, Cashbox was the same as Billboard and Hits magazine. It was a trade magazine. And I was the associate editor there, uh, and I started, my partner Richie Wise and I started producing records. Most of the stuff we did was for Neil Bogart, who at that point was the president of Buddha Kama Sutra, a bubblegum label. He had since made a deal with Warners uh, to distribute Casablanca, his brand new label. And he was looking for a credible street rock band. And as a result, he would leave a box of all of his demos outside of his office door. And I would walk from cash box to his office, pick up the demos, schlep them on the D train, take them back to Brooklyn, and over Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday, listen to all the demos. Inevitably, I would return them all to his office Monday morning, except for this one Friday, when one of the packages I opened up had this black and white 8x10 of a four-piece rock band in kabuki makeup with designs, and they were all wearing what looked like turtleneck shirts that you could buy at Walmart or Target or back east John's Bargain Store. And I got it. I saw the marketing value based on all my years of working with local rock bands in Brooklyn. I knew about marketing. I listened to the tape, and it fucking knocked me out. It just destroyed me. Strutter, Firehouse, Black Diamond, Cold Gin, on and on and on. I brought it back to Neil on Monday, and I said, you got to sign this band to Casablanca. Now, I'm sure Bill O'Coin, who just signed him to management, had a copy of the tape. I'm sure other people had a copy of the tape. But for some reason, he did not act until I brought the tape in and said, you got to sign these guys. Probably because Richie and I had already had a half a dozen hit records with him. So he took us seriously. He set up a rehearsal at this small dance studio called La Tang. You've heard the expression, no bigger than the shoebox? Mm -hmm. This was the shoebox. <laughs> it was so small that 15 people filled the entire room. The ceiling was so low. You know, these guys walked out on stage with six inch heels. They couldn't stand upright. I was looking at four Neanderthal men performing, and I was afraid if, if Paul, God forbid, jumped up, I had this vision of his head sticking into the ceiling and his body hanging. That's how small this room was. They finished their set. Gene and Paul walked to the back of the room where Neil and Bill and me and Richie were standing, and uh, Neil says, 
Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, you'd like you to meet Kenny Kern and Richie Wise, they're going to produce your first album for Casablanca. The rest is wow. history. And you produced the first... I, yeah. Richie and I produced the first two albums. Two albums? Yeah. With them. And, yeah, the rest is history. I mean, they... It's history. History, yes, exactly. Right. History. Now, right. you, you, what's an interesting thing, you mentioned in, in as part of the story that you were one of the associate editors of Cashbox magazine. Right. Now, you have a background in journalism. You're also a published author. Right. How has that helped you in the music business? Uh, tremendously. Uh, it it uh, allowed me to learn how to do interviews, to, to write proper emails. Um, you know, one of the greatest jobs I had in the industry was at Music Connection, where I was senior editor for nine years. Thank you, Eric Patelli. Um, and it was just great. I met all of the people in press, all of the people at labels. I interviewed 175 A&R people. So it helped me navigate the entire music industry just by the virtue of the fact that each week I was dealing with a different segment of it. Interesting. So it okay. helped me out tremendously. So you were able to build your network extensively through, the, uh, through that? They all owe me. Okay. <laughs> That's for that. No, I mean, it was a great job. You interviewed the biggest artists in the world. Right. I mean, I interviewed Motley Crue, Cher, Michael Jackson. Uh, Dick Clark, mm -hmm. uh, some of the biggest artists in the world, some of the biggest executives in the world. Mm -hmm. I reviewed albums. I wrote an A&R column. I interviewed A&R people. They took me out to lunch and dinner. They bought me Christmas presents. And at the end of the week, they paid me. <laughs> they gave me a paycheck for this. Right. It was ridiculous. So it was a great, great, great gig. Now, you know, you had mentioned you're, you're 45 years in the business now. And I understand... I don't uh, look at they over 18, right? That's right, you don't. <laughs> I understand that you're working on your autobiography right now. And yes. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Why now in particular? What was it about it that spurred um, that particular decision? Firstly, because I have the time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because every time I get together with some people and we talk music and we exchange stories, I always wind up telling them the story of, you know, uh, me and Jim Morris and how he fell out of a cab when he was supposed to be playing at a show we booked at Hunter College and and how uh, uh, Jack Bruce taught me how to snort cocaine from a pen top and and they always say why don't you write a book why don't you put so I decided to write a book and I didn't realize how difficult it is to write an autobiography it's just it's just ridiculous you have how do you edit it what do you put in what do you leave out so I've been working on it for about a year, and it's called uh, I Discovered Kiss, My Life and the Music Business. It has three sections. The first section is my family. The second section uh, is the my life section, and that is steamy. It goes into all of my private sexual adventures, <coughs> my drug years. Did I say my sexual adventures? Yes. It goes into that. And the third section is my music, and that has all of the stories about Jim Morrison, Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce. A funny story, I did an interview with uh, Eric Clapton at the Gorham Hotel in New York, which was uh, the same as the Hyatt House was here years ago. Finished the interview, and right next to the Gorham was a movie theater where Dylan's movie was playing at that time, Don't Look Back, and he wanted to go see it. so. We went to the theater. We got out about 8.30, 9 o'clock, we had dinner, I went home. The next morning I get a phone call from my brother who was at Stony Brook University, really pissed. I said, what's the matter? He goes, you told me to fucking go see Cream. I bought tickets to see Cream. The show was last night. They didn't show up. I went, uh, yeah, I was at the movies with Eric Clapton and he had to cancel the show. And he was really pissed at me. but. He missed the show at Stony Brook. We went to the movies, and oh, that's a my great brother. Story. Yeah, so all this stuff is in the book. Well, we'll be looking forward to the book. Definitely. So will I. I'd like to get it edited <laughs> and formatted, for heaven's sake. Now, Kenny, you were the gentleman who invented and created the music business program at MI. Right. And now I understand you have an entirely new program that you have created. Can you tell us about it? Uh, I'd be delighted. That's basically the reason that I'm here today. Chris Fletcher, my best friend and colleague, uh, and I started the Cool School. Basically, that is an education facility where for almost nothing, 
$20 a lecture, we provide the music business tools that they need. Every Saturday starting in February, the first one is February 8th, at the Cool School, which is 4735 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, right in, a, in the heart of the Art District, we are going to have two rooms. Mm -hmm. Each room has a giant stage, theater seating. So if you have a live band and you want us to work on your live production, we could do that. We're also going to do open counseling, career counseling, personal management. We're going to do lectures every other Saturday from 2 to 5 p.m., uh, time management, social networking, uh, improving your networking skills, um, booking your local and national tours. We're going to give the musicians all of the business tools they need to be successful, and it's going to cost $20 a lecture. That's it. No time commitment. You don't have to do it for six months. You don't have to take a loan for $20,000 like you do at all those other schools. And the reason is those other schools <clears throat> are not our competitors. They're not our competition. By offering these lectures for $20, we've already surpassed them. We're making it available for every single musician to take these lectures. They don't compete with us. I'll tell you who our enemy is. I'll tell you who our competition is. Our competition is ignorance. Chris and I want to get rid of ignorance. We're tired of seeing 30-year-old musicians who don't know the first thing about copywriting their material. We're tired of people who don't know how to market themselves, who don't know why they're recording the CD, what they're going to do with it. We're tired of it. Everyone can afford $20. And between the independent artists and the bands, we need to stamp out ignorance. That's our major competitor. And with the cool school, we're going to do that. So we'd like to start by asking everybody to email us at coolschoolbiz at yahoo.com coolschoolbiz one word at yahoo.com we will send you our digital brochure we'll tell you when our events are happening you can tell your friends twenty dollars and you could start getting the tools you need without having to go into hock for the rest of your lives okay that's great I'm glad to hear that and you know we will be promoting that and getting that word out there that's fantastic terrific I'm going to hold you to it because you have a big network of of people that watch Mubu TV yes we do thank you so much for doing this it's my pleasure Rich. I really appreciate it